Okay, um, I'm happy to be here uh, and to tell you about, about research that we're doing at a new center uh, at my university in Switzerland, which is dedicated actually to augmenting cognition, but also mobility and, and perceptions, a center for, for neuroprosthetics. What I would like um, to do today uh, is about tell you about two different aspects of, of what we're doing in my particular research laboratory. One part is, is science, so we're going to talk about um, how the body is represented in the brain, how have we and other researchers looked at this in the past, and then one particular aspect that came in the last talk that the notion of self was mentioned. So we believe in the lab that understanding this body representation will be very helpful also to understand scientifically what it means to have a self. And I'll give a definition in the next slide. And then within this center, what really I, I try to develop and with, with my colleagues there is a form of cognitive neuroprosthetics that doesn't really exist yet, but we want to basically by what we understand here, manipulate and controlling aspects of the body representation of relevance for self-conscious, project this to machines, artificial uh, limbs and robots, uh, eventually that we've also seen in the, in the first talk to be mentioned. So the subject of self in cognitive neuroscience, it has been studied, as you know, for, for, for 2,000 years. Philosophers initially, psychologists very recently, and now neuroscientists, uh, particular cognitive neuroscientists and computational neuroscientists are, are looking at the, the problem of the self and the related aspect of consciousness. But it's one of those things that everybody in the room here knows what it is to have or be a self, to be somebody, but when you then have to define it, or I have to define it, it's, it's kind of a tricky thing that is like, like consciousness, very, very difficult actually to define, and then that everybody would agree on. Uh, uh, agree on. So, so this is one definition that I find very helpful to just get started. The self is, is, is you, can, you can see two aspects. For, first of all, physically I'm different from Amir, who is sitting uh, in the first row. Uh, so I'm different from other social beings from, from the same species. I'm also different from the environment, this chair for example. So the self is this entity that is really different, or we have this uh, conscious experience that we're different um, than people and objects around us. But then there is this this mystical thing that we are this entity who is having thoughts, who can reflect about myself, about other people, and also actions. These are my actions. These are my left hand movements. I am the one uh, generating these. But of course, it's my brain generating these. So what is it in the brain that leads to this sensation? Well, that it's actually me, and, and, and what is this me that is doing this? Cognitive neuroscientists, and this would take up the next 13 minutes, I think, at least, if I would uh, go through this, don't worry. Obviously, I will not uh, uh, do this, but people have studied visual recognition. If you look each morning in the mirror, for example, people have thought um, that this is a nice way to understand the self. They have looked at memory, thought, language, intentions, social aspects, but all these, in my opinion, just look at sub issues of the problem. We've, we started looking at one particular sub-aspect of the problem of the self, which is body processing. How do I move my hand? How do I feel my body? And what's the relevant for, for the self? And I show you one illusion, instead of more words, how this can be tested, uh, actually in the research lab. And actually, a notion that we all have that this is my hand, or this is your hand in, in the audience, you, you would say probably, well, I can't get it wrong that this is my hand and not somebody else's. Uh, hand. But neurological damage actually suggests that this is a frequent a disorder, a relatively frequent disorder in the clinic, but this is even more striking in all of us. We could induce this illusion very quickly that we don't recognize our own hand as being, as being our hand. So basically what's, what's happening here in the video is this is the, this is the subject that is studied. There is an, uh, a, a screen here that occludes his hand. What you will see is that the experimenter applies a touch cue here. But at the same time, at this ridiculously looking fake hand, could be a robotic hand in the near future, there is another touch cue that is applied, but that's only seen, okay? So there's a conflict with respect to what you, what you see in, uh, in real life, called the rubber hand illusion. <laughs> so in, they're even having fun in the research lab, that's very good, maybe he has not so much fun. If you repeat this experiment, I show it one more time, not because it's so great, but it's really, if you look, the aggressor is coming from here. But what is introduced is a link, a trick. The brain is tricked to believe that this fake hand, that he uh, actually is his left hand, right? He should pull away this hand because the aggressor is coming from here. He pulls away this hand because the brain creates erroneously links between this hand and this hand. And in normal life, of course, if you see and feel a touch, it's always at the same position. 
What the researchers do here in the Roman hand illusion, they create a conflict. They put 20 centimeters in between, and then if you feel the touch at the same time that you see it, you believe that this is is um, your hand. So this is called the rubber hand illusion. And there's two illusions. Why is this called an illusion? Well, the fake arm, which is this hand here, feels like your own hand. So if you ask people to rate that the fake hand feels like my real hand, this is rated very highly in this condition. Also, you feel the cue that you see applied, you feel it really as if it was applied to your real hand. Okay, so you get these two things very quickly wrong. One minute of stroking induces this. There is a recalibration. If you ask to point towards your real hand, you make errors. Your brain does not find its own left hand anymore after one minute of stroking. Although on everyday basis, we always think that this uh, should always be correct. It is not. And the brain regions involved, I briefly showed you them here. This is functional fMRI that was introduced, can be used to find and define the brain regions involved in this. Now, what we have been interested in the lab, I will be brief on this, is define or do two things. First of all, we want to induce the illusion in an automatized way. We don't need anybody else stroking. We want to have a, a, a simple stimulation method applying the stimulus. Um, then we provide the virtual hands, not fake hands, over a virtual reality display. And then we can do many, as many conditions for as long as we want. And we have been able to show that much stronger illusions can be induced in this, in this state. Uh, we can on also go on to move uh, to analyze brain signals online while the subjects are involved in this paradigm. And we have recently built, together with the computational neuroscience group at EPFL, a Bayesian model, a model that accounts for what the subject, how the subject will behave. In our particular interest here, what is perceived as my hand or not. So it's not the subject who controls this, it's us as experimenters who can control how the subject will uh, react in those methods. But I started out by trying to come up with a model for the self, this entity to which things, perceptions, and actions are ascribed. But what I've manipulated in the rubber hand illusion is actually how a hand is ascribed to this entity, to me, yes or no. So we're not studying the entity, actually. So in this line of work, we actually go a step further, is the main part of, of, of the lab, and we try to come up with a version not a rubber hand illusion, but a sort of rubber body illusion, a full body version. Can we do similar illusions for a full body? And so what we, what we developed is a sort of avatar virtual reality setup. So you see a camera here. Now the experimenter is standing here. The person with a, uh, a white shirt is now our experimental subject. And now the subject will not receive stimuli on the hand, but on the back. As you can see here, I think there's a short video on this as well. There's also more. More of this on, on, on YouTube, uh, if you type virtual out-of-body experience. So there's a stroking stimulus now applied here. So this is just like the stroking stimulus at the, at the, at the hand. But now what the subject is seeing, because the subject is wearing a head-mounted display, goggles, and all the subject is seeing is what the camera is seeing. So the subject is standing here, but actually sees the body, the own body, two meters in front. So there's the same distance that we have between the two hands that we now exploit for the full body. And uh, you're not surprised maybe at this point to find that if you apply the stroking here at the same time, then you see it, there is a very strong illusion that actually this avatar's body or this, this virtual body that you see is your body. So what works for the hand now also works uh, for the body. And I was very happy because if you imagine we have to induce stroking and automatize stroking patterns for each finger, for the hand, for the arm, we would have to do a lot of stroking devices. This is a minimal version that seems to shift and distort our own full body representation. Okay, because if you change this representation, the hand representation is also likely to be changed. I mentioned there is a recalibration. So how well are subjects localizing their body? What we were actually to find here is that this person will not indicate where the self is localized, namely here, but it will be drifted several tens of centimeters in a predictable direction, a recalibration towards the avatar's body. So the brain starts really identifying with this body, self-consciousness, but also we can measure this behaviorally that they actually, the brain starts thinking to be two meters uh, in front. We have done several other studies um, looking at what happens to brain processing during this illusion. Just two quick things. If we apply a touch cue to the back, you perceive them less well. If you apply a painful stimulus to the body of the experimental subjects, they endure more pain. There is pain analgesia. So these also for applications to patients are interesting conditions. Time is running fast, so I skipped. There was a robotic setup that we, uh, that we developed here 
using an fMRI scanner, we, we, we built a robotic system here replacing the mattress that allowed us to do our condition also using a brain imaging. What we could find is that there's a dedicated region here in red that is activated and distinguishes whether my brain localizes me here or at Idan's position or at another person's position. Depending how far this is, how this is manipulated, this brain activity puts us at a certain position in space. So having normal activity here puts me into my body in the first place, and this is an ongoing active brain process. This is not just this region. You see other regions shown here in blue are also activated. And uh, this was interesting for me. I'm an MD by training, neurologist. We initially started launching this line of research by studying patients with so-called out-of-body experience, which have exactly what we've tried to induce by these stimulation techniques. Namely, pa patients with out-of-body experiences feel to be at a distance of two to three meters from their body. So this is actually holding the system between neurological data and with data from cognitive neuroscience. The self is often considered, and this is the science conclusion, a very uh, mysterious or great, greatest mystery of the human mind. Actually, these data show that we should not wait another 60 years before studying it. It actually seems to be quite simple to study it, more simple than we, we thought. And what I want to focus on in the next part is how can we use and exploit this capacity to control our full body representation in order to augment and, 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 and control artificial robots and bodies. So this comes then to the part of cognitive neuroprosthetics, um, the projection of self-consciousness, these aspects that I've just presented to you, self-identification with the body and calibration of where I am in space to computer-generated avatars, robots eventually, and probably what will happen, happen first, uh, prosthetic devices and artificial limbs. But I will start first with telling you about a project that is actually ongoing. The first people actually on this planet who are already using and extending their bodies uh, to incorporate tools are actually uh, tools are, are surgeons who are using minimally invasive uh, surgery devices. This is a system that we have available uh, in Geneva where the surgeons actually stop operating. And when we're studying, um, you can see a system here is when the surgeon sitting here is driving a robot that is inside a patient's body. You see the surgeon sitting here. Normally, the surgeons used to have their hands inside a patient's body. Now, all that is inside the body is this minimally invasive a robot that is carrying out the operation. There will be a video soon. What we are interested in is to follow up, actually, on data that come from neuroscience, which have shown that once you hold a tool in your hand, like this laser pointer, it becomes part of your body. The brain starts treating the tip of the tool as the tip of my index finger. Now, now, with these huge robotic tools, we have the possibility to see whether this metaphor actually is, is consolidated also by neuroscientific data. This is activity in parietal, parietal cortex, and I, I've used this system myself. It's very intuitive. Seeing these devices that you will see in a second feels like as if you are manipulating with your fingers in that different entity. But what does this mean? These are new tools that we never used before. One prediction for, 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 for this, uh, this meeting could be that there will be new brain regions already particularly at work, and I'll stop this nasty video in a, in a second, but this is how the surgeons operate now and will probably operate in the future, and you could operate, of course, a patient at a, at a, at a far distance. But what we are interested here from a neuroscientific point of view, is this going to be a new kind of hand and a new function and a new brain region in parietal cortex? More down to earth, maybe phantom limb patients and amputee patients, like this patient with a right upper limb um, uh, amputation, feels the persistence of a hand. So there's ownership. This is not just a random hand. This is his hand perceived like this. And he feels this hand. There's touch cues. Now, how we know already that this presence of these phantom limb sensations that sometimes lead to phantom limb pain actually are linked to differences in how your brain is organized here in primary somatosensory cortex. Now, I've mentioned before that we have this automatized version of the rubber hand illusion, and there is work here by, by Todd Kuiken from the University of Chicago where automatized form haptically controlled rubber hand illusions are induced in phantom limb patients and amputee patients. Look at this patient, upper limb amputation. There's the stump here. Tactile cues are applied here in an automatized fashion while the fake hand, a prosthetic hand, is receiving touch cues. So this line of research will actually, once these are fully connected to the um, human body, be able, whenever the artificial hand will touch a certain device, will be sent over these interface structures, two brain structures that actually record and encode in you and me um, when we really have our hand touching um, a physical entity. 
So this is yet another version. So in my concept, the right design of this artificial limb will be very similar to the right design for robotic surgery. Both are tools that the brain very easily incorporates into its body representation. And if this is incorporated, we'll probably have, have new functions because we can then start also in the, robot, in, in the surgery case, for example, not just have one arm, but several arms. 30 seconds, okay, so I, I'll be finished after this. I just wanted to finish also with entertainment and maybe some uh, industry applications. So two applications that I mentioned were for the upper limb. One application that I see also is computer gaming and video conferencing, for example. If you think about the projection of, um, of the avatar or of self-consciousness towards the avatar that you've seen on the, on the video projection, what about video conferencing where everybody would project selfhood to an avatar and we one could meet and interact into this scenario. Actually in computer gaming this is ongoing in so-called first-person perspective games and what one idea that we're pursuing not just of course in this line but also with respect to robots and exoskeletons that will be able to support um, um, and human walkers is that either in the simulated way you see there is once in a while you see the hand a first pack, uh, perspective, uh, perspective computer game you see that this is kind of exactly the same scenario that I've shown you, that if we apply this additional stroking, the brain starts believing that you are actually this red figure that in this computer game, first person perspective, is actually your body. So you could project this to this one body, but also to additional bodies. And I thank you for your attention and look forward to your question. So I wanted to ask you, do you think that within two or three years in the president conference, I will divide the avatar of yours, <laughs> you will see it in Switzerland, okay? and, then, and, then, and then we all feel, and you will feel that you are personally here. Well, I always thought um, is that Israel is the, is the country of technology, but let me tell you how we do PhD defenses in Switzerland. So many people don't come actually in this video conference for PhD defenses is really increasing a lot. Um, so, so sometimes, if, if the video conference is good, you actually do have the feeling that that person is there. Of course, this is my part, but I think if these kind of technologies are improved um, and people are giving up on the idea that everybody really has to physically be there to, to do such evaluations and, and many other interactions, I think this will be more and more happening. I think video conferencing and how we interact over, instead of being on the telephone is just one, one example. What is missing is the neuroscience and the computational part of it. Yes, sir. I, have I understood you correctly when you say that tools which cannot be integrated into our own personal bodily image are, in a sense, impossible, therefore we could not have four arms? I, I, think, um, I, yeah, I, I think we have to see what is not possible. There will certainly be certain tools that are, that are not possible to incorporate. So the robotic tools, it looks like pretty impossible, but once you use the system, the robot feels just like a, a, an arm. An interesting question for research is how many arms can our brain actually incorporate and represent in the brain? I think we may not be limited to two. And Hollywood shows us uh, non-scientific examples, of, of course, of this, but I think um, 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 the human brain probably has the power to incorporate more than just four limbs. Actually, there's patient examples that I, I probably don't have time, but there's a case of supernumerary phantom limbs after brain damage. So these patients will perceive two or three left arms so we could turn into insects. <laughs> if, it's, if it's necessary uh, to, to, to lift uh, 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 devices, uh, why not? I mean, if you think about the brain and, and, and what some of these robots do, they're not built on the, on the, on the, of course, the human body, but I think it's a nice potential that we don't exploit it. Thank you very much. Very much.